I didn't stand a chance. It happened so quickly. I can't even describe the pace to you. It happened within seconds. I could feel this gust of wind heading towards me. How everything cracked around me. I made myself very small so I wouldn't be hit by the avalanche and torn to pieces. And then I knew this would be my death. Mrs. Dreyer Leuthold. Years ago, an event happened that changed your life permanently. You were buried by an avalanche. You wrote a remarkable book about this experience called The Avalanche. Would you tell us how this accident came about? Yes, gladly. Even as a small child, I used to go hiking in the mountains with my father. My sister and brother always wanted to go up and down mountains by ski lift. But I was the only one who went ski touring, meaning hiking up mountains on skis with my father. I really enjoyed it. It's something I wanted to carry on doing my whole life. So I'd go ski touring in the mountains every year, either by myself or with my family, with my husband or a group of people. I've got to say that I'm not really a good skier. I usually relied on people who were experienced. So we had this tradition that we'd ski tour up the mountains with a group of family and friends every year at the end of the winter season. It was like a ritual, like saying our farewells to winter. One year my daughter organised the last tour. It was a new tour to Oberalp Pass. As a child, I used to go there for ski holidays for years. I knew it very well, and I was looking forward to going there. We were a group of seven people. Three people from my family and four friends. But for some reason, I wasn't really into it that year. It had rained for a long time. The conditions weren't ideal. I didn't really know what was wrong with me. Before that, I'd had a weird dream that was about death and tunnels, about horrible things that were driving me to hell. So I knew I had to go through it. But I woke up and had no idea what this dream was supposed to mean. At that time, my youngest daughter was about 20 years old. She came home and told me that she had toothache. So I thought, all right, let's stay here. But it was her first tour, and she really wanted to come with us. It was a gorgeous day. It was so beautiful. The train was packed and many ski tour groups were going up to Megel's hut. Right from the beginning, I was quite unsure of myself. I slid off over and over again. My speed wasn't good. After some time, however, I found my rhythm and it was just extraordinary. I was so happy to see the white expanses the steel blue sky and nothing else. Of course, I was scared of avalanches because it was the end of March. According to the weather forecast, the danger of avalanches was quite high. But everything had gone well. We arrived at the hut and had a fun evening. The next day, the good skiers went up another mountain. 
and a friend of mine, my daughter and I, went for a walk to the source of the River Rhine. That means you were already staying at the hut, and so you got the impression that everything had gone well, and that your fear had been unnecessary. Exactly, that was the feeling I got. It had been a very good night, so quiet. The weather turned out perfect again the next day. That was, well, everything was fine again. During the walk, my daughter Cornelia asked a few times, isn't there a danger of avalanches today? And I answered, where should an avalanche come from around here? This is a huge plain, that's nothing. After that, we went back to Megel's hut. We had some food there, and at that point, I already felt as if I was in a movie. I didn't really hear what the others were talking about. I didn't eat anything. I also didn't drink anything. I was thinking, it would be nice to be back in the valley in Chamut on the way home. So I went into the hut and asked the landlord Bruno whether there was a danger of avalanches today. And he answered that it was always dangerous whenever the snow was in the right condition to form avalanches. We should just follow the orange posts on the way down, because it had already turned into something like a ski slope. I didn't need to worry going down there. But his words didn't comfort me. So we started off, the seven of us. Rudy and I were in the middle. Rudy is my husband. And it was a gorgeous ski descent. We stopped every now and again and discussed how we'd proceed. And soon we were able to see our finishing point, Chamut. Then we skied to the Oberalp route. There was this gallery to stop avalanches from blocking the road. So we skied into the first gallery and suddenly I got really scared. I stopped and asked Rudy, isn't it dangerous here? He said, look, the avalanches have already come down. They've already gone over the gallery. You don't need to be scared. This is a sure indication for tour skiers. Then I moved on, and I was still extremely scared. I kept thinking that I should actually stop now. When we came to the second gallery, I said, I won't continue here, I just can't. My knees were like jelly, and I felt very nauseated. Three people from our group were already far ahead of us, and two of them were behind us. Rudy said, come on, move. And I realized that I was playing up again shortly before the finishing point, so I moved on. I looked up the slope and saw that an avalanche was breaking loose. I didn't trust myself, I couldn't believe my eyes. I looked away and then up again. And I realized that it was really an avalanche and huge lumps were heading towards me. It was happening really fast. The people ahead of me were calling out, go back! I didn't know whether I should go back or forth. And suddenly Rudy said, go back! I could see how he jumped up and turned, but it was as if I was stuck there. I didn't stand a chance. It happened so quickly. I can't even describe the pace to you. It happened within seconds. I could feel this gust of wind heading towards me how everything cracked around me. I made myself very small so I wouldn't be hit by the avalanche and torn to pieces.
and I knew this would be my death. I'd already stuffed my jacket into my backpack and also my mobile phone. You know, I'd almost reached the finishing point and it had been quite warm. Then I just panicked. I just said my farewells to everybody in one sentence and really quickly, and I knew this was going to be my death. Then masses of snow hit my head, and I noticed that I was swirled around in the air. I also heard cracking noises around me, like a forest, like trees breaking up. And then I was gone for a while. Unconscious? I suppose I was unconscious, yes. I woke up again and had no idea where I was. I had the notion I was in a thermal spa, and that the sound of burbling I could hear around me was the murmur of the water. I was thinking, it feels a bit tight in here, I'd like to swim away. And then I realised that I'd been hit by an avalanche. Are these the masses of snow that have buried me? I realised that this was a serious situation. That first of all I needed some air. I tried to make some room with my hands and arms, but it didn't work. I didn't know where my arms were. I wanted to use my legs to make some room, but that didn't work either. Then I got really scared. I thought, now I'm going to be buried alive. I also realised that it was becoming tighter around me, greater pressure. I almost couldn't breathe anymore, and I was thinking, now I'll have to breathe very little, so it will last for a while. And I wanted to open my eyes, but couldn't. I only managed to open one eye a tiny bit, and everything was dark around me. And then I thought, well, okay, this isn't good. I must be covered by at least half a metre of snow. Otherwise, I'd still be able to get some light. I panicked. I screamed, and strangely, I was screaming like Jesus on the cross. Oh God, oh God, why did you leave me? But there was no sound. I thought I'd screamed very loudly, but it was just... Internal. Yes, internal. And I had a huge fear of death. Everything hurt. Well, I felt like I was suffocating. My whole body was in pain. I thought, at first I got very angry. Why did I join this stupid ski tour? I should have known better. I'd had the weird dream. I hadn't been in the mood for the ski touring trip, and I should have listened to my inner voice. But I didn't. I was devastated. And of course I felt sorry for myself. I would have liked to experience more in life. And now it was over. Then something like light images appeared. They were people I knew. I was able to say my farewells to them. Sometimes it was a whole group of people. Sometimes anybody. Sometimes it was a person I didn't want to say my goodbyes to. There were also people with whom I needed to clear something up. But this was beautiful because I was able to resolve some things. 
I could reconcile my mistakes or faults. For example, my husband appeared three times for a very long time. This felt really good. I thought, if I had known that during my lifetime, I would have done that a long time ago. It was such a good feeling to be at peace with everyone. But I was still desperate. I knew that I was close to death because I was seeing these images. And I couldn't really accept death. But eventually I told myself that I wanted to come to terms with things. I wanted to feel okay during the time I still had. As soon as I had said this, I felt lighter. The pain disappeared. I didn't have this fear of suffocating anymore. There was enough oxygen for me. I was no longer cold and I felt like... Now I felt like I was in a good place, somehow as if I was accompanied. I also had a feeling of contentment and safety while I was completely aware that I would die now. Then a film started playing. It was my biography. Actually, I didn't want to watch it. I wasn't in the mood for watching all those uncomfortable moments and reliving them. But it was still playing. I could also turn away when I didn't want to watch something. I felt that everything was happening again. And as if from afar, I watched a few scenes, and some of them I wanted to watch again. They were the ones that hadn't been that clear to me. And just as I had said goodbye to people, I was able to say goodbye to my biography. Then the film finished. I then realized that everything had a purpose. Well, that I was born, that I lived through phases. I also realized that the avalanche and being buried by the avalanche had a purpose as well. And everything was good for me. A being appeared in front of me. I'd say it could have been an angel. It accompanied me. This being didn't scare me at all. It had... It was surrounded by light and safety and benevolence. It said, I'll come with you now. I'd already stepped out of the avalanche and now saw my daughter Cornelia sitting in the snow. She was being taken care of by other people. I saw how my husband, Rudy, was desperately running around in the snow looking for me. I saw how Ollie tried to comfort Rudy and how distressed my daughter Angelica was, and that she was being comforted by Sonia, her friend. And I saw, well, that this was life down here on Earth, but that I'd go now. The angel asked me if I had another wish, and I had lots of questions. I wanted to know who God was, And the angel answered, you know that already. And I was immersed in such a feeling of peace, happiness and safety that I told him, yes, that's true. 
I know what that is and who that is. I asked a lot of questions about mathematics that I'd never understood and about medicine. I was an auxiliary nurse and there were many things I hadn't understood in that field, a lot of contexts. The angel explained everything to me and it was beautiful. I thought, I'd like to go to the hospital now, then I could explain everything to the students there. And I realized that all the questions had been answered. I didn't have any more questions. I was completely content and happy. The angel also asked me, do you have another wish? Yes, now I'd just like to die in peace, I said. I'd just like to die in peace. I completely accepted my fate. I lay down in the snow and waited for my death. I was very happy. Maybe my father would come to get me or my grandmother. I was very relaxed at the prospect of who would come to get me. And then I fell asleep. How did your rescue come about? How long were you buried by the avalanche? And how were people able to find you? Well, the actual time I was buried for was between 20 minutes and half an hour. But to me it felt like years. There was no time for me anymore. But if I had to translate it into present time, the experiences felt like years. Just behind our group, there'd been a group of tour skiers with a guide, a mountain guide who had seen whereabouts I would be. He also found one of my ski poles and told people where they should look for me. They were poking with their ski poles into the snow and stumbled upon something hard, which turned out to be my blue ski boot. There they started digging. Soon the mountain rescuers arrived as well. They were stationed in Andermatt, which wasn't far. They helped to dig me out. The snow was hard as cement, so it was difficult. They had to use pickaxes, and that's how I experienced it. I woke up and everything was dark around me. I felt as if I was in a sphere and I felt very, very heavy. I wasn't happy that I'd been rescued or that I was about to be rescued. I would have loved to stay where I was. I also felt as if I were being pushed aside. I felt like I was just a body and that my soul no longer existed. That was a great conflict for me. The people up there were so happy. They were giving the thumbs up. Yeah, she's alive, she's going to be saved. How, we don't know, but she's going to be saved. And I had... I didn't want to be rescued. And somehow I felt really, really heavy. It was an experience... It was like being hit by a bomb very hard. And now I was alive again. It wasn't a good feeling. Were you able to understand your experience with the avalanche properly? Were you able to talk to people about it? Well, from the first moment I was alive again, I knew I would write a book about it. But actually I wanted, I wanted to write a book that would have one page and it would say content, then the book would be finished. I went to the Canton Hospital in Luzern and was lucky that everybody who had been part of the ski tour and also my son came to the intensive care ward. 
Intensivstation kamen. I felt a strong need to talk to people about my experience. Everybody was... It went very well. I noticed that they understood what I'd experienced. They didn't dismiss it at all, like you're nuts or this is a mental illness or something along those lines. That was very good for me. Also, the doctors who were there were very understanding. I asked for a priest, a psychologist, the auxiliary nurses who were there. None of them, really none of them, spoke in a disrespectful way about it. In your book, you write that already as a child, you had a great fear of death. Did this experience change your fear? And did it have a long-lasting effect on you? Yes, it changed me. And it also had a long-lasting effect on me. As a child, I was awfully scared of death and, of course, of a possible punishment. For that reason, I decided to study auxiliary nursing at the age of 46. I needed to get to the bottom of it all. What is life? What is death? What is the process of dying? What happens during that time? I just wanted to get closer to it all. But I was always, I was always very scared. To some extent, it had prevented me from living, this fear of death. After this experience, it was gone. It still is. The fear has disappeared. How did your return to normal life take place after this accident? How long did it take you until you were fit again? Well, for me it was very helpful that I had a lot of injuries on my body. It meant I had a lot of time to catch up with my soul, because it was completely different. For me, my soul was badly injured. I had the feeling that I didn't really want to live here again. I wanted to be an Oberab, because it was as if I'd left a piece of my soul up there on the mountain. It was like not coming back anymore. I don't want to go into too much detail when it comes to my injuries, but it took quite some time. I'd say it took about half a year before I really got better. I also had the same amount of time to recover mentally. I have to admit that I felt at my limit quite often. I had this longing for death and to die somewhere or somehow. I've also been in touch with people who've been revived, and they said the same. This conflict, you were lucky, be content, it could have been much worse. This was very difficult for me. I just needed time mentally in order to say, yes, now I'm good, now I'm recovered. Earlier, you were speaking about a dream you had before the accident. In your book, you write that the dream was about dangerous and adventurous travels. How would you assess this dream in retrospect? For me, the dream was like a preparation. Meaning I would have been able to escape my fate. Well, today I have the feeling that wherever I had been, the avalanche would have caught me. It's just that it was an avalanche. It could have been a car accident too. But from today's standpoint, it was like a preparation for me. In retrospect, these things happen again and again, or they've already happened quite often. What role does religion play in your life? Have you always been a religious person, and has your relationship with religion changed due to your experiences? Well, before the experience with the avalanche, I had been searching for something. Searching for something over and over again. I'd also read a lot about religion, but never experienced it. For me, this was okay, and for others as well. But I'd never felt it from the inside, this feeling of safety and security. Yeah. 
And due to the accident with the avalanche, I gained this personal relationship with religion. This feeling that eventually everything is going to be fine. Eventually dying is peace. And that feeling is in me now. Your experiences are also part of a new documentary with the title The White Ark at the Brink of Another World. What does this film depict? Edwin Bela was the director. He had read my book too. He was planning a new film and asked to speak to me. With my help, he wanted to show what effect a dramatic experience has over a long period of time. What do I make of it? How do I live now? And that's how this film came about. He filmed me in the dementia ward, how I support people now. Would I have done that before or not? How did I cope with the death of my own mother? She was also extremely scared of death. And what was the result? These are the things that he shows in his film. In other words, does an experience have a long-lasting effect, or does it fade after a while? How present is this experience still for you ten years on? How much of an impact does it still have on your life? The event itself has evaporated, of course. I also wanted to get past this, well, just the event. But it had a huge impact on me. Internally, I've become a completely different person. You wouldn't see that from the outside. Other people who'd known me from the past would say, now you're finally your old self again. But for me personally, I'm not the same inside anymore. When you say that you changed internally due to this experience, but others perceived you as somebody who hadn't changed, did you feel conflicted because of that? I found that very good. Yes, I can live with it well. Yes, I do. I feel a lot more liberated. Many people have a great fear of death. What would you like to share with them as a result of your experiences? Well, I work in a job where I have to support dying people over and over again. And often they are scared for themselves and their relatives. Ever since I had this experience, I've been able to support them very well. I can also take them into my arms. I'm just convinced that everything is going to be fine. And often they calm down. They believe me. I know that you have to live through death and the process of dying yourself. But this feeling of security that I have now is comforting. Mrs. Dreyer Leuthold, I wish you all the best for your work in the future and thank you very much for this wonderful conversation. Thank you. I'd like to thank you too.